Well, tonight we're going to be in Romans chapter 6, and let's follow along in verse 5. And actually, we're going to, we're going to pick up at the last part of verse 4, and we'll read down through verse 8 as we continue our series, No Condemnation, uh, the book of Romans, verse by verse. It says in verse 4, Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. We're going to preach tonight at least through verse 8. Pray for me as I preach and let's pray together right now. Father, thank you for this wonderful week, for the privilege in this week past to preach many times and to teach. And, and uh, Father, now we gather together with our church family And Lord, this church family has served, but we now need to be strengthened by your word so that we might be prepared for a new week of walking with you. Help us to know the reality of the verses we're going to expound upon and hear tonight, and we'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Two weeks ago, we were challenged with two questions that needed to be answered. The first question was, should we continue in sin that grace may abound and what was the answer to that question god forbid god forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein the second question dealt with our identity and it dealt with who we are in jesus christ and what is pictured in baptism and we looked at baptism as being baptized into the body of christ by the holy spirit and also into water baptism, our identity with the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, we're going to continue studying the ramifications of Calvary upon the life of every Christian. In particular, tonight, we're going to understand what it really means to have newness of life. Many times, we hear about, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, but not everyone experiences that same degree of newness or blessedness. And so tonight, I want you to notice that the new life is what Jesus Christ designed for you and for me. Let's look first of all at the planting of the new life. I have a garden in my backyard. I'm not a good gardener. I don't spend enough time pulling weeds. I don't really have the time to tend to it like I should. But I just can't hardly stand to have any space of dirt in the backyard without planting something in it. I just feel like my granddad's looking down from heaven saying, you know, you ought to plant something in that garden, uh, being that he was a farmer and I spent so much time with him. And, and so I enjoy planting seeds in the garden. There's just something amazing to me about planting one kernel of corn and having a couple of ears or husks come out on that corn a few months later and each of them having a couple of hundred or more of their own kernels of corn in them. And there's just something about watching life spring forth and here we're going to learn about the planting of new life verse 5 for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection now notice there is a planting uh, in spiritual death we are joined with Christ in the sense of his death upon the cross in fact it says if we have been this verb is in the perfect tense it means that uh, we were planted once but the process is ongoing we are still in Christ we have been planted with Christ now this is a picture then of our sanctification and we've been learning some of these terms justification and now we come to sanctification Uh, it began with our justification but this planting continues with our sanctification once for all the seed planted now grows in union with Christ and so we were planted 
but we are planted with the Lord. And notice it says in verse 5, if we have been planted together, uh, born together with, or of joint origin. When uh, we are saved, we are in joint origin with the Lord. Uh, as a graft in a tree, uh, so that the engrafted branch shares from the life of the tree. So when we are saved, we are engrafted to Christ and we grow in Christ. Uh, Phillips wrote in his commentary, the word exactly expresses the process by which a graft becomes united with the life of a tree. So the Christian becomes grafted into Christ. We become vitally united with him. We share his very life. And so uh, in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, as we are in Christ through salvation, we are joined with him. We are identified with him. And notice it says this in verse uh, number five. It says, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. The word likeness is that which has been made after the likeness of something or the resemblance of something. And the likeness in us is produced by our union with Christ through salvation. It is produced by his spirit that is within us. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to see someone that is reflecting the union of Christ. Uh, Dr. England and I were doing a, a television interview for the Korean Broadcast Network this afternoon. And they were asking us questions about the Bible, the preservation of the Scripture. And then they said, what about the Bible in someone's life and the Spirit of God in someone's life? And we were very clear to share with them that we're not Pentecostal. We don't believe that someone's word is equivalent to the preserved word of God. We don't practice that. But there is a way in which you can say that person is a living Bible or they are living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we are united with Christ and grafted with Christ, we're planted together with Christ in salvation, then we should bear the fruit of Christ through our life. And we told them that fruit is from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God at work in our lives. And so there is a likeness with Christ. Now, we died with Christ uh, in baptism in that sense. When we were placed into the body, uh, we are united with Him once and for all. And because we are incorporated into Christ, His death, his, the victory of His death becomes ours. Uh, at our conversion, the death of Christ becomes ours because we share the benefits of His death by virtue of our incorporation with Him. What are the benefits of His death? Well, the main one that comes to our mind is that He conquered sin, death, and the grave. And all of that victory is ours in Christ. We are no longer forced to be the servants of sin. We can have victory over sin and victory over death because we are in Christ. And thank God for that. Phillips also said of this passage, Paul is seeking to convey the remarkable truth that Christ's death is our death. His burial, our burial. His resurrection, our resurrection. He not only died for me, he died as me. So far as God is concerned, we are already on the resurrection side of the grave. Hey, that is our position in Christ today. We identify with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I'm saying to you tonight, it's a good thing to be in Christ. Because in Christ, there is victory over sin, death, and the grave. This identity did not stop. This this identity in Christ did not stop uh, with the death of Christ. It continues after the resurrection of Christ. So we are planted in the death of Jesus Christ or grafted in. We are planted, united with Christ in his death. Now, secondly, we are risen in new life. We are risen with him. When we say our identity is found in the cross, what exactly do we mean? We mean that we are planted in his death. We identify with a victory over sin that comes through his death and his blood atonement. We identify with a victory, secondly, that comes with his resurrection. And this is found again in verse 5. It says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, this crossover into the life of the resurrection is so wonderful for all of us to understand. We are identified with his death, 
his burial, and his resurrection. And this happens through salvation by the Holy Spirit. It also happens practically in baptism. I was just talking with the three young men who were baptized tonight and explaining to them as we review, we always talk to the children about baptism. If they don't answer some very basic things, believe it or not, sometimes we don't baptize them. How many of you believe they ought to know what they're doing? But they answered very well, and they said, this is our testimony, and we're doing this because Jesus uh, died for us, and we, we we're showing a picture of Jesus with us, and, and uh, we want to understand the significance of baptism in this way. We are identifying uh, with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21, says it this way, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And this, this brings this home in verse 5 when it says, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh, this is related to the future of each of us as believers that one day with our glorified bodies, as we have been identified with Christ on this earth through his spirit, we will also be identified with Christ in heaven with our glorified bodies. In other words, the ramification of the cross is not just for this world, it's for all of eternity. And we will be with him in our glorified bodies as well. Now, uh, this doesn't mean that we have experienced fully yet what we will experience. How many of you are thankful that even though the old man is crucified, how many of you understand, and we're not thankful for this, you understand we still live in a fleshly body. But how many of you are thankful that in heaven we'll have a glorified body? And this is the ramifications of the new life in Christ, ultimately in our glorified body. Turn, if you would, to Romans 8, just for a moment, chapter, 10, chapter 8 and verse 10, as we consider this new life. Romans 8, 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. That's what we have to look forward to with the resurrection. There will be a quickening. There will be a renewing uh, of our uh, mortal bodies because of the working of the Holy Spirit in us. And so Romans chapter 6 and verse 5 speaks of the planning of the new life as it is pictured in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's move secondly to the purpose of this new life. The purpose of this new life. Now, we understand the purpose of salvation. We understand the purpose of sanctification. But notice a little further down, verse 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Knowing this, this is the object, this is the purpose of the crucifixion of our old man with Christ. So know this. What does God want you to know about the purpose of the new life? First of all, that the old man is crucified. The purpose uh, that is shown to us is the old man is crucified. Now our old man, who is the old man? That phrase is used in two other places here in chapter 6. Uh, the fact of the matter is, as we think of it, the old man, our Adamic nature, is killed according to the Word of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Uh, Colossians 3, 8, and verse 9 as well. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, communication out of your mouth, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Now in all of these places, the old man is referring to our old life in sin. It is referring to the old sinful nature, the Adamic nature. And the purpose of the old man being crucified with Christ shows us that we have victory and that the victory is found in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now notice a phrase in verse 6. It says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. 
Now, the body of sin is first where the old man resides, our physical body, which is marked by the effects of sin. The body of sin, McLean said, is the body we have in which, the, in which sin finds an instrument, the tongue, the hands, the mind. Sin does not find its source in the body. Sin finds its source in the will, but uses the body as an instrument. And the body of sin, the Bible says, might be destroyed uh, by the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so it was. In essence, the old man is dead, so now our body does not have to be enslaved to sin any longer. Are there temptations of the flesh? Do Christians sin? Yes. Does a Christian have to be a slave to sin? No. Uh, should a Christian, does a true Christian wake up every day intending to sin, planning to sin, no remorse over sin? That is not the mark of a, of a true Christian. A true Christian is someone uh, that is walking in the Spirit, uh, reckoning themselves dead to sin. The old man was crucified at the cross and being alive in Christ so that Christ is living through them. That's their desire. And uh, when there is sin, they're, they're quenched, they're grieved in their spirit. And so the Bible says here uh, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That sin uh, would be nullified or abolished is the prayer of the believer. And this abolishing took place at the cross, the victory is already ours according to the Word of God. So the body of sin is destroyed, and we are not to serve sin any longer. Notice that in verse 6. It says, henceforth we should not serve sin. Let's say that together. Henceforth we should not serve sin. One more time. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. since the body of sin is destroyed, in Christ, the old man is crucified, henceforth we should not serve sin. Now I said a moment ago, do Christians sin? First John answers that question. First John says, my little children, I write these things unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have what? And we have an advocate. The Word of God acknowledges that sin comes in the life of a believer and also commends us to go to our advocate and to confess our sin and that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and thank God for his mercy but we should not continue in sin that the grace of God may abound and in fact we the Bible says henceforth we should not serve sin I think there's a corollary here to the passages in first John which indicate and sometimes confuse a new Christian when they say that if we sin we are none of his and when you study the context of those verses and, and cross-reference here to Romans chapter 5 and verse number 6, you'll find that the context is a continual life of sin. If someone is living a life of prolonged, unconfessed sin, there's no remorse, there's no repentance, it is likely that they are none of his. A true believer, when there is sin in their life, acknowledges it, confesses it before the Lord. And so the word should here uh, speaks to the issue, and it says we should not serve sin. The, the word should also is interesting because it implies that a conditional choice is made. It is, it is the idea that we may or may not choose to do this. We have the ability to not sin in our body, and we should not sin, but there is a choice that the believer will make. We'll see that at the conclusion tonight. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. And so God is showing us if, if we're dead to sin, if we have been rooted with Christ, if the resurrected Christ lives with us, and we are engrafted with Him, then really, we should not serve sin. Somebody say amen to that. We should not. We should not. And yet there is a choice. There is a choice to yield to the Lord. There is a choice to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin. We'll see that in a moment. So the purpose of the new life, first of all, the purpose is that the old man is crucified. Secondly, that we should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. We are dead, severed from sin, freed from sin. I like the story of the two men that found a, a turtle one day whose head had been completely severed off. 
and the turtle uh, had its head severed off and the men were looking at that turtle as it walked around and they were arguing a little bit. One said that the turtle was alive, the other one said it was dead. The argument got kind of heated. They went back and forth, back and forth. And, and finally one of the men said, well, he said, the truth is it's dead. It just doesn't believe that it's dead. And the fact of the matter is that's how some Christians are with this text. We are dead positionally to sin but we are not believing what the Bible says about who we really are. We think that we have to revert back. We rationalize that we have to revert back to sin. But in reality, we are dead to sin. Uh, there is, one author said, a corpse in view here. It does not matter how great a sinner the corpse was, it's now free forever. And so the purpose of the new life is that we are dead to sin and that we do not serve sin any longer. The old man has no power over us as we are in Christ. The planting of the new life, that happens at salvation. The purpose of the new life is that we might not serve sin any longer. And then notice, uh, thirdly, the permanence of the new life. Now look at verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that, Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Amen and amen. The permanence of the new life. Let's see a few things about this tonight. First, the permanence of the new life shows us that we will live with him forever. Not only are we in Christ, engrafted with Christ in this world, not only through his work at the cross can we find victory over sin, but we will ultimately live with him forever. The Bible says this in verse number 8, if we be dead with Christ, we believe also that we shall live with him. The power of this chapter is the fact that we not only died with Christ, but that we live with him in new life. Turn, if you would, to Colossians for just a moment. A wonderful passage about this permanent new life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Colossians 3, 1. And the Bible says here in Colossians 3, If ye then be risen with Christ. Now some uh, teenagers or young people might say, well, I'm not risen. He's up in heaven. He's at the right hand. I'm still down here on this earth. But that's not, again, that's not what tonight's message is about. Tonight's message is about your position. Your position as a Christian is that in Christ you identify in his crucifixion or death and uh, also in his burial and now in his resurrection. So if, Colossians 3 says, you have been risen with Christ, which every true believer is risen with Christ positionally. This is what is pictured here, the death, burial, and resurrection. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So God's Word is teaching us that we are not to seek the things of this world, the sinful things of this world, we are dead to those things. We are to be seeking the things of God. And that's why we're here tonight. And that's why we gave tithes and offerings today. And that's why we'll pray and read the Bible tomorrow because this world is not our home. We are seeking the things which are above. And our mind is settled on that. We're living with Him and we will live with Him. Now we forget the past life of sin and we focus on the blessedness of our relationship with Christ and the future of our relationship with Christ. According to verse 8, we shall also live with Him. We live with Him and we have been raised with Him. Secondly, notice in verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath dominion, no more dominion over Him. Here we see that our Savior has conquered sin, death and the grave. How many of you are glad you don't have to wait for Easter to celebrate that? But we celebrate it every time we gather. He's conquered sin, death, and the grave. Hebrews chapter 9 speaks of this for the sake of time. Hebrews 9 28 says it this way, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him 
Shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation? This is what we're looking for. The fact that he has been raised and that he is coming again. He was raised up. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. It indicates that death could not keep him. It had no dominion over him. He is risen. His work is finished. Christ now lives to make intercession for us. Romans 8 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God and also maketh intercession for us. And so we see the permanence of the new life. We are alive in him now. We will live with him in the future. He is awaiting for us and preparing a place for us now. And finally, as we think of the permanence of the new life, all of these promises are founded on God's word and the finished work of God himself. And I want you to see that as we close in verse 10. The Bible says, For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now what a great truth. This is the mockery of the Roman Catholic sacraments. The Roman Catholic sacraments, as they have people line up at the altar, I've witnessed this in different Catholic cathedrals in foreign countries, people coming up to the priest, and the priest standing there with the wafer and the juice. And because of their belief in a doctrine called transubstantiation, they believe that the bread becomes the body, and they believe that the juice becomes the blood. And if you've come from a Catholic background, you might remember these words. Receive Christ. Receive the body of Christ. Receive the blood of Christ. And we know, as we study the Scriptures, that at the Lord's table, we are remembering. We are doing this in remembrance of Him. We are not getting saved again and again and again. And we are not practicing cannibalism. And we do not believe that we're eating the body of Christ or drinking the blood of Jesus Christ. We're commemorating the broken body and the shed blood. But what I want you to see here tonight, in that He died, He died once. One time. And we don't uh, over and over and over again uh, celebrate uh, this type of, of, a, of an idea of the broken body and the blood uh, in the literal sense that way. Uh, and notice also in verse 10 something interesting. It says, for in that he died, he died unto sin. It doesn't say he died for sin. Now how many of you believe he died for sin? But he also died unto sin. Interesting phrase. William Newell in his commentary on Romans said, do not, confuse, do not confuse Christ died for our sins, but that Christ died unto sin. Christ is seen dying to sin, not for it in this particular verse. What is meant by that? Christ is made to be what we were, that we might become in him what he is. Now let me read this one more time. Why the phraseology in verse 10 that says uh, here that in that he died, he died unto sin. And a tremendous thought is this biblical thought that Christ died unto sin, that he was made what we were, that he was tempted in all points like we are, but he never sinned. And thank God uh, that according to the scripture, that he died unto sin. Christ is made to be what we were. The word became flesh that we might become in him or through him what he is. And what he was and is is victorious over sin. And in Christ, we also can have that victory. And that's the significance, I believe, of the word unto. Also, we read of it in 2 Corinthians. And as we close, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21. One of the great verses in all the Bible. Many, many preachers would tell you this is the gospel in a nutshell here. Just like John 3.16. And, and yet this is such a wonderful verse. If you haven't underlined it, it's a great verse for soul winning. It's a great verse for soul winning. And I recommend you use it. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, 
that is God the Father, hath made him, that is God the Son, Jesus Christ. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Jesus Christ took all of our sin upon himself on that cross. The skies of heaven were darkened. The Father could no longer look upon his Son. Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He hath made him to be sin for us. Now notice this phrase, who knew no sin. Let's say that together. Who knew no sin. Yes, he died for sin, but he also died unto sin. That's my Savior and your Savior. He knew no sin, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. What are the last two words? Now you say, well, I don't always feel righteous, but if you're saved, you've been made the righteousness of God in Him, through Him, because of Him. The only reason we have standing before God is because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. God's way was not to change the old man, but to send the old man to the cross and to put it to death and release us from it. And no one who remains in Adam's race will be saved. We must be dead to that through the Lord Jesus Christ. And at salvation, the victory was provided. The glorification of that will be known and seen for all of eternity in heaven. But God says, listen, when you got saved, there was a planting of new life. The old man was crucified. You were engrafted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a purpose in all of this. And that purpose is that sin uh, might not be prevalent in your life, but that you should not sin serve sin. That is the purpose of this planting, that you would know the victory of Christ. And this is a victory for now and forever because our Savior died unto sin once and He is our soon returning Savior and we in Christ are on the winning side forever and ever and ever. Now I know sometimes you read Romans 6 and you might think to yourself, this is awesome. This is wonderful but it's not always my reality. Sometimes I feel as though I don't have the level of victory that a new man should have. If the resurrected Christ is in me, then why do I sometimes revert back to the fleshly behavior? And why why is this old body of my flesh so, so easily drained or tempted? And sometimes one may ask that question. And I want to tell you something, as we said a moment ago, Many times it's like the turtle that was dead but just didn't really believe it, just didn't really know it. The fact is that we've got to reckon. We've got to reckon this to be true. We're going to come to verse 11 next week, but let's take a quick peek for our conclusion tonight, shall we? Likewise, reckon. Everybody say reckon. Reckon. We're going to learn more about this accounting term next week. Likewise, reckon. How many of you are from the South? You know that word, right? Well, I reckon, right? Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through, our, through Jesus Christ our Lord. There must be a reckoning. There must be an acknowledgement. There must be a daily time of reckoning with the Lord. Lord, I come before you today and I reckon your word to be true. I reckon my life to be dead to the old man and alive to Jesus Christ. And Lord, I know I'm still living in this old flesh suit and sometimes there are temptations that come. Father, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Lord, I reckon your presence in my life and I seek the guidance of your Holy Spirit today. Help me, Lord, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto Jesus Christ. Now listen. Many Christians will hear a sermon like this and they won't open their Bible till next Sunday. And they wonder why there's no victory. There's a reason the Apostle Paul says in this chapter, I die daily. Daily, Paul said. He, he, he reckoned himself to be victorious in Christ. He claimed that. He lived that. He knew that. 
because it wasn't once a week for him. It was moment by moment and day by day reckoning himself dead to sin and alive unto Christ. And I can tell you something, that when sin plagues you or a bad attitude plagues you or whatever the sin is, and if it's plaguing you for a week or you're ticked off about something for a month, and many Christians live that way, somebody help me with this. If that becomes a persistent pattern in your life, it is indicative of the fact that you do not read your Bible. You do not sincerely seek the face of God and reckon yourself dead unto sin. You do not seek the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. And these must be sought for daily. We must come before the throne of grace. And we must find grace to help us in our time of need. John R. Rice said all of our failures are prayer failures. I think also we could say our failures many times are just reckoning failures. We're not reckoning who we really are in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter how old you are. You cannot go even a few days without getting into the Word and reckoning what Christ has done for you. You can't go a few days without suddenly being very susceptible to that flesh suit. Very susceptible to those old habits of anger or whatever the outbursts may be. And so, we'll pick it up next week, but just as a little preview, I want to challenge you this week. You've heard that you've been engrafted in Christ, that the old man is crucified, and there's victory in the new man. Now, reckon that to be true in your life each and every day. You say, well, how, how do I start with that? Listen, you might want to do what I've done in my life at occasion. Write out the book, uh, the, the, the chapter of Romans 6. Go ahead and write out each of the verses, Romans chapter 6, and come on down through uh, in these passages and, and, and write it out and put it in your pocket. And one of the ways to make this reckoning real is just to read Romans 6. Just put it in your pocket. If, if, if sometimes in your heart there's a temptation to anger, put those verses right by your heart. Put those verses right where you used to put your cigarettes. Put those verses right where you're going to pull them out and you're going to be reminded of who you are in Christ. Because they tell me it takes about 40 days to really develop a principle in your life, to really get something hidden in your heart. And so I want to challenge you to take these truths and reckon them to be real in your life and claim them by faith each and every day because God has a real purpose for you and it's a new life through Jesus Christ. Let's stand together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to open your word tonight. We thank you that we can study the ramifications of the cross, what it means to be buried in Christ, identified through salvation, through our baptism. I pray, Lord, tonight that you would help us to experience the purpose of this new life, Lord, we believe it's going to be a permanent glorification, but we want victory now. And so help us to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, alive unto Christ. And Father, may we crucify the old man and, and may we daily die uh, to, the, to the temptations that would come, as did the Apostle Paul. Father, bless this time of invitation. Help us to personalize the passage. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed for just a moment. Is there someone here tonight who'd say, Pastor Chapel, I hear you talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and how it brings victory, but I'm not sure that I have ever accepted Jesus Christ into my life. I don't know that I've ever been buried with Him at the cross. I, I don't know exactly what that is. I don't know what it means to have the hope of eternity in heaven. And maybe you're here tonight and you would just simply say, I would love to have new life but I'm not sure I've ever had new birth to begin with. I'm not sure I've ever been planted in Christ. There definitely is a beginning point. It's a new birth. It's a moment when you're planted in Christ. Most people who are Christians have had that memory. I wonder who tonight would say, Pastor Chapel, I'm not sure that I've ever been planted in Christ. I'm not sure that I've ever truly been born again. Would you pray for me? I'd like to know what it means to be truly born again. Would you lift your hand if I might pray for you about salvation or what it means to be born again tonight? Is there anyone like that? How many of you tonight would say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I've been planted in Christ. But truthfully, 
I've not been living out the purpose of new life. I've not been reckoning myself to be dead indeed unto sin. And I'm seeing that often it is because of a neglect of just taking time with God to wrecking these things to be so. And I want to take these principles and come to the Lord each morning and just say, Lord, today I reckon myself to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto you. Lord, live through me today. Help me to choose what you would choose. Help me to run from what you would run from. And if God's speaking to you about living the victorious Christian life, the Christ life, I'd like to pray for you. And I wonder how many of you would say, I want more of him. I want more of the Christian life. I want to know the new purpose that Christ has for me. Pastor, pray with me. Would you lift your hand tonight if God's speaking to you about this? This is the life that was designed for you. This is what God intends. Father, would you help us this week? As we arise in the morning, Lord, we want to arise with you. We want our eyes upon your word. And Father, we want to reckon the great victory, the truth, that we don't have to serve sin and that henceforth we should not serve sin. And Lord, help us to reckon ourselves dead to that old man alive to Christ. And Lord, we'll thank you for the victory that is in Jesus as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's some wonderful principles.